Father, we're about, open, we're about to open up the Word of God and try to preach. Lord, we can't do it without your Spirit. We can't do it without your help, Lord, without your anointing. God, we feel your presence in this place. God, we ask all week, Lord, that you would come and, Lord, walk up and down the aisles of this church and in between each pew and, Lord, deal with your people and, Lord, those that might be sitting here, Lord, that's hanging on to something, Lord, they just need to let go of. God, we pray that you would have your will and your way. And, Lord, we strive, uh, Lord, to be obedient to you. So, Lord, we ask you, Lord, that you would empty us of ourselves. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Lord, have your will and way. Lord, we, we finished. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified, that you would be lifted up. We pray, uh, Lord, that you would draw all men and women unto yourself. And, Lord, we'll be careful to thank you and to praise you for what you do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. What's the point of a right life? What's the point of a right life? Well, you know, if, if uh, no one sees you eating, then the calories don't count. If you drink a diet soda with a candy bar, the calories, it cancels out the calories. Uh, calories don't count if you eat with someone else because, and you both eat the same amount, they, they cancel each other out. If you fatten everybody up around you and make your, it makes yourself look thinner. Uh, snacks consumed at the movie don't count because it's part of the entertainment. Pieces of cookies contain no calories because the baking process causes a calorie leakage. Late night snacks have no calories because the light in the refrigerator is not bright enough for the, uh, calorie, for the calories to find their way to the calorie counter. So never eat more than you can lift. That's Miss Piggy's Guide to Life. And uh, there's one thing said about a diet that never does improve your appetite. And that's a silly illustration. But there's not a lot of truth to it, both for the calories and for life. As a little offering plate was being passed, a little girl took the tray and, and she put it in the floor. And, and then she stood in the offering plate and the usher kindly looked at her and said, uh, little girl, honey, what, what are you doing that for? And she said, because they taught me in Sunday school that my whole body is to be offered to the Savior. This little girl got the point that it was her that God wanted and not a donation. The main idea here in Romans chapter 12, if you would turn to Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. The main thing here is, is because of God's mercy, Paul begs the believers to, to dedicate themselves to God and, and, to, and to dedicate themselves to God in worshipful obedience and serving others in the church. Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, if you would please stand uh, for the reading of God's Word. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, would you bless the reading of your word? And God, would you help us for the next few minutes? We ask in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Here in these passages of Scripture, uh, God, Paul is begging again the readers to, to dedicate themselves wholeheartedly uh, to God. He says here to offer yourselves to God in verses 1 and 2. He says in verse 1, give your body to God. In verse 2, he says, give your mind to God. In other words, do not allow this world uh, to squeeze you into its mold. Verse, it's verse 2, the first part of that verse. Don't allow the world to, to form you, to squeeze you, to, to make you look like the world. Now, in a lot of places in, in our churches today, the, we've allowed the world to squeeze us into their mold. 
Christians have allowed the world to squeeze them into their mold so that we look more like the world than, than the world looks like us. I mean, we ought to be penetrating this world and, and be attractive to this world. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. He also says uh, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind in verse 2. The, the therefore in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 tells us that, that there's a shift coming uh, in these verses and that we need to look back at the previous chapters of, of where Paul is writing about the grace and the mercy that is, was displayed by the Messiah. He's saying, you need to go back and you need to look at all the mercy and the grace that, that I've been writing about. Amen. I thank God for his grace and for his mercy. We're all sitting here this morning by the grace of God. Hey, listen, I thank God for his mercy this morning. Because if it wasn't for his mercy, any of you ever played mercy in school? That's an old game for you teenagers. We used to grip hands like this right here. And then we'd twist them and we'd try to, and the first one have to say Mercy. And you didn't, you, you wanted to try to pick a little feller, but I'm going to tell you that some little fellers could get up on them hands and make you holler mercy. But I thank God this morning that God don't, he, he, he poured out his mercy on us. Amen. He took the suffering so that we wouldn't have to. He took the, and, and he poured it out upon, and listen, believers are exhorted to live in a view of his mercy. You and I are to live in a view of the mercy of God. I think a lot of Christians today have forgot about the mercy that God has showed upon them. How do I know that? Because of the way Christians treat each other. Amen. Hey, come on. Hey, we, we are Christians and, and we have been shown mercy. Therefore, you and I should show mercy. He, he's writing to us and he exhorts us to, to live in view of mercy. In these two verses, we are told to, to offer ourselves uh, to God in total surrender and dedi <clears throat> dedication. Let me ask you this morning, Christian. Are you totally, completely, 100% surrendered to God? Or is your life totally dedicated to him this morning? And listen, if a Christian is living selfishly and independently of the body of Christ, my friend, there's a heart problem. If he's living independently, selfishly of the body of Christ, then there's a heart problem. The problem is a lack of surrender to God in worship. We're talking about living a right life. We're talking about the Christians living a life that's right before God. Can I tell you this morning, a polluted mind leads to a polluted life. A polluted mind will lead to a polluted life. So how are you living right now? Are you just getting by? Are you just making it by this morning? Are you successful? Listen, how are you happy this morning? Uh, are you uh, frustrated this morning? Are you, uh, are you working too much? Are you tired? Or are you frustrated? Frustrated with church? Frustrated with the family? Frustrated with school? Frustrated with work? Frustrated with everything that's going on in the world? Are you content? this morning here's another question for you how are you living life now how are you living life now are you treating people right are you treating those around you right are you living a right in right relationships uh, with everybody around you are you living uh, a right conduct are you living right in your conduct are you living a right life at work? You realize those people around you at work see how you live and they know who you are. But is your life uh, uh, living, uh, are you living a right life around those? Are you living right at school? Are you living right? Are you, are you, are you thinking right thoughts? Or are you living a right life is the question today. So far, we looked at what's the point of church in your life. We looked at, at what's the point of a new life. This week, we're looking at what's the point of a right life. A right life. What, what do I mean and what am I talking about a right life? Last week, we talked about a new life through Jesus Christ, a life through him. We've seen last week that, that if we come just as we are, lost, undone, carrying the burdens, and we give them to him, then we can see, we saw last week that we're not guilty that we've been justified we see that we've been released and that we've been forgiven from those sins we've seen last week that we in right standings uh, with God we've been considered righteous and we now live life at the fullest 
That's what God does for us. That's what he does for us through Jesus Christ. He gives us a new life. What is a new, what is, with a new life, though, that we have that new life, now that we've come to him and he's given us a new life, that comes with a responsibility. There's an expectation of us as Christians once we come to that new life. We are expected to live a right life. I think I could probably get an amen here. I ain't begging for him. Thank you. But don't you think that God expects us to live a right life? Did he save us for us just to keep living the way that we were and the way we've always lived? The answer is no. When God saved us, we have a now have a responsibility, and that's to live out Christ in front of a lost and a dying world so that they will want to come to Jesus. The reason why people's not getting saved ain't God's fault. He, hey, listen, the blood still saves. He still saves. The reason why people's not getting saved is they see the people in the church living a life outside the church that's not right with God they see us if you don't think it affects the people around you my friend the devil has you deceived what we Lord how mercy I, I like social media don't get me wrong but what we post on social media how we act on social media how we act at work how we act around people listen they see us as who we really are and they do they see Christ in our life he expects us to live a right life. We have uh, some responsibility. What is a right life? It's a life that is committed to God. A right life is a life that's committed to God. It, we're to offer ourselves, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, to live a, a, a living sacrifice. We are, uh, listen, we are no good to God if you are living a dried up selfish life. If you're living a dried up, selfish life, you're no good to God in that state. He wants us to be living a, a, living a life of sacrifice for him. To sacrifice takes commitment, does it not? If you're going to li live a, 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 be a living sacrifice, it's going to take commitment uh, on your part. A commitment to put God first in everything that we do. A commitment to put God first in everything. Listen, it's a life that's been, according to verse 2, that's been transformed. I like to look at it this way. A life that's been remodeled for God. Because he takes what we used to be, <laughs> which wasn't pretty. A uh, mill house in Lockhart. Anybody in here grow up in a mill house? I ain't ashamed of my mill house. You, I told you before, you could see through the walls. You can see daylight coming through. You get warmed up by the sunlight if it was shining. <laughs> it was ugly, you know, and, and I, I wasn't too crazy about bringing people home with me because I didn't like where I didn't. But, hey, listen, I grew to realize I thank God for where I was born and raised. But I grew up in a mill house, and it wasn't pretty. Well, my daddy was a pastor. He worked a full-time job, and, uh, and he remodeled our mill house. He took that old mill house and he made it not look like a mill house anymore. <laughs> I'm glad that when God saves us, he remodels us. I'm glad that he takes us and we don't look like we used to. We now look different because of what Christ has done in us. He, he remodeled us. There's, there's to be a, a extreme change in our life when we come to know Jesus Christ. There's to be a, a significant difference. Uh, and we don't have to walk around and tell people and write it on our back and write it on our forehead people will be able to tell if God has changed our lives God saves us but after that we are saved we have a responsibility Paul writes that your bodies are to be transformed we have a choice to live a right life so what's the point of a right life But before we get to that what's the point not the point of a right life what's not the point of a right life can I tell you this morning, it's not being loved more by God. 
It's not about being loved more, loved more by God because Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You, you're not any less loved by God than you ever have been. He's always loved you. He will always love you. And he died for you. But listen, it's not about being more loved by God. It's not about being more saved by God because you are as saved as you're ever going to be if you ever ask Jesus into your life. Let me ask you a question. No, that's a different sermon for a different day. I ain't going there. How many times have you ever been saved? I am going there. Because I feel like the Lord wants me to. You've been saved one time. Amen? So if you can only be saved one time, if you ever mess up, you're done for. No, sir. If that's the case, then my friend, we're all going to die and go to hell. I thank God for forgiveness. I thank God that he comes into our life. And once we get saved, listen, yes, we're going to mess up. But I thank God this morning that he helps us to live a right life. And he cleanses us and he, he molds us. He wants us completely uh, dedicated to him. What's the point of a right life? It's not about being more saved. It's not about earning brownie points with God. You can't earn brownie points with God. Any of you ever tried to brownie, brown nose? <laughs> yeah, you have. You try to brown nose. You know what brown nosing does? It starts to stink after a little while. You can't brown nose God. Because brownie points don't get you nowhere with God. You must be saved, you must be born again, and you must be living a dedicated life to him. So what's the point of a right life? It's to experience a complete relationship with God. The point of living a right life is to live a complete relationship with God. God is completely committed to you and me. Listen, if you'll leave heaven's glory and come to earth and take on the form of a man and take a beating that you didn't deserve and climb a hill that you're on your hill to climb and let yourself be nailed to somebody else's cross and die a death that was someone in someone else's place and be buried in a borrowed tomb and rise again, I would say that's pretty committed, wouldn't you? To actually leave heaven's glory and to come to this earth. Listen, that love and commitment and salvation and eternal life will never change. It'll never change. But our commitment, but our commitment to God does change. Think about a parent-child relationship. Think about a parent-child. Once you have parents, you can't change them. Tyler, have you ever wanted a different mama? Huh? What about a different daddy? Maybe. <laughs> Me too, brother. <laughs> Listen, you may have wanted one, but once you get your parents, they're yours. There's nothing that you can do about it. There's, listen, you can drift away, you can pull away, and you can even run away, but that doesn't change your status, but it can ruin your relationship. Christians, listen, you can run away, you can drift away, you can fall away, and it don't change your status as being God's child, but it does ruin your relationship. When God is our Father, that will never change. But if we live contrary to the way that he says that we should live, it ruins our relationship. Our relationship suffers. I remember as a teenage boy doing stuff I shouldn't be doing. I'd come in late night. Daddy wouldn't say a word. But, man, I'd be feeling guilty, feeling bad. And even though Daddy hadn't said anything, our relationship was suffering because I had knew I had done something I shouldn't have been doing. And then when I confessed it to the Pope, he said he wore that hind end out, and then our relationship was suffered. Now I'm mad at him. Listen, when we do stuff as a child of God that's contrary to God, and he spanks us for it, then our relationship has suffered. Listen, we need to live a right life. 
when we drift away and we pull away, our relationships suffer. Listen, we'll never experience a full relationship with God if we're not right with God. What's the point of a right life? It's to experience a complete relationship with God, and it's to experience a life of joy. I like to be happy, but happiness has nothing to do with joy. You see, happy is an emotion based on happenings. Amen? Joy is a fruit. It's a product of God working in us. That's what joy is. God himself is the source of our joy. So it can't be taken away. If God is the source, then it can't be taken away. It is possible to have joy in the fullest, even during the most difficult times. It's, it's possible, church, listen, it's possible to be full of joy even in the most difficult times. How is it possible for a Christian to be excited about being a Christian living in the world in, that we live in? Because it ain't about the world that we're living in. It's about the world that we're going to get to go to. Listen, it ain't about what's going on around us and the happenings. It's about the joy that we have in God. So, child of God today, you have joy in the fact that you are a child of God. We can rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so because our redemption is not based on happenings. It's based on God and what he's done for us. Joy comes when we continually praise God for what he's already done. When we live a life, a, live a, life, a right life, we have the joy of knowing that we're pleasing God. We have the joy of knowing that we're pleasing God who gave everything for us. Listen, things might get bad. Things might go south. Even when we're committed to him, things may fall apart, but we're being transformed. We're being transformed. Living right life brings joy that can't be stolen. What's the point of a right life? It's to experience a, a complete relationship with God. It's to experience a life of joy, and it's to impact those around us. Living a right life is to impact those around us. If our relationship with God is damaged, if our relationship is bad with God, it's been, it's been interfered with, something's separating, it's, it's, it's been damaged, guess what? Our relationship with other people is going to be bad. If our relationship with God is bad, our relationship with others are going to be bad. Listen, if we have no joy in our life, listen, we have no joy with others. If we're not happy with God, then we have no happiness in, in with others. The question to ask is, is, do you make Jesus appealing to those around you? We spent a whole series on turning the world upside down. Listen, and so we're not going to labor here long. But does your life, does your life impact those around you? Are people drawn to God because of you? That's a question every Christian ought to ask themselves. Are others drawn to Christ because of me? Are others pushed away because of me? Are people attracted by the transformation in you? Listen, if there's never been any transformation, if there's never been any change, people are not going to be attracted. Listen, is your commitment to God affecting your life? Not only is it affecting the lives of those around you, it's affecting your life. If you want to live a right life, here are a few things that you can do to help. Seek God, not sin. You want to live a right life? Then start seeking God. I, I, I live by this. The Bible tells us to, that uh, whatsoever thou doest, do to bring glory to God. Whatever we do, we should do to bring glory to God. So, when I'm being tempted to do something that I shouldn't do, God, is this going to bring glory to you? And it keeps me from a lot of sin. It keeps me out of a lot of trouble. It, it, seek God and not sin. You want to live a right life, fear God, not man. You want to live a right life, and then get your priorities in line. Start fearing God and stop fearing men. Listen, don't fear those who can take the life here, but fear the one who can give you life eternal and who can save you from the fire this morning. Fear God and not man. Love God and not the world. Amen. 
Love God. You want to live a right life? Then love God and not the world. This world has nothing to offer us. I don't know if we could ever sing it. Ever who's up here doing this? But if we can ever learn, I'm not home yet. This ain't my home, building 429. I'm not home yet. Listen, church, we're not home yet. This ain't our home. I'm just passing, amen, throw it at me. I'm just passing Appalachian Baptist Church on my way home. Amen. I just made a transfer change from Union, South Carolina to Greer, South Carolina, temporarily. I just pitched my tent down there on, on, a, on the river. In a little while, I'm going to my eternal home. This is not our home yet. We're not home yet, church. Love God and not this world. Believe God and not the deceiver. You see the problem? Can I be real with you for a second? The problem with a lot of us sitting in this room today is we've listened to the deceiver. If you're a child of God, raise your hand this morning. Satan's not your daddy. The Bible says, I have a father. God is our daddy. Listen, child of God, this morning, Satan has no control over you. You need to start telling him to get behind you. Listen, Satan is not the leader of you. God is. You need to stop listening to the deceiver because he's leading you in a bad direction. And you need to start listening to the Father. Lost person, if you hear this morning, listen, stop listening to the devil and get your heart right with God and start listening to him. Believe God, not to say, obey God and not your appetite. I used to love Hardee's, and I quit eating at Hardee's for a long time, but them biscuits drawed me back. But you tell me why they got to put a half-naked woman on a billboard eating a juicy cheeseburger? Calls sin sales. You see, men, they appeasing their appetite instead of pleasing God. Obey God, not your appetite. Serve God and not yourself. You want to live a right life? Then serve God and stop serving yourself. You want to live a right life? Then worship God, not comfort. It's time we step out of our comfort zone and we stop, start worshiping God. So how to begin a right life? For the believer, it starts by re repenting and recommitting. If we want to live a right life, Christian, we need to repent and we need to recommit. If we go, for the unbeliever, it means just simply trusting Jesus and coming to him. As we stand heads bowed and eyes closed as Robin begins to play and or lead or, or Jay leads or, or whatever we're doing. As you stand, your heads bowed and your eyes are closed. You hear this morning and you're a believer. But that life you live in just ain't right. Start living a right life. Commit it to Him. Repent and recommit. If you're here this morning and you're lost, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your personal Savior, then you just simply need to trust in Jesus. You need to come and, 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 and Ryan or, or Butch or myself will take a Bible and show you how to be saved. Trust in Jesus. He loves you. He died for you. One day he's coming back. You're either going to get to go with him or you're going to get left behind. The choice is yours.